I think we can get started. So welcome back to panel six, Citizenship and Regulation. Uh, so I'll turn things over to Marina Dahlquist at uh, University of Stockholm, who will be uh, chairing this panel. So thank you so much, Martin. Thank you all in the audience for joining us here tonight, as it is in Stockholm at least. Uh, so we're moving away from patent and copyright uh, into censorship and regulations, and we will have different examples from around the world. Uh, we have four papers and five speakers, I hope, in this panel, or we will get there. Um, and as in the other panels, we will have the Q&A after all presentations. And we will start uh, in the Philippines uh, with Nadi Tofigian. And Nadi is a research fellow at the Department of Media Studies at Stockholm University. So he's a, he's a colleague of mine. And very, very soon, he will be an associate professor at Linnea University. And among uh, many other projects, he is uh, uh, the special issue editor for early popular visual culture. And he is currently working on his monograph on early cinema and US colonies. Uh, and the title of his presentation today is Evil, Indecent and Immoral Films, Colonial Censorship in the Philippines. So the floor or the screen is yours, Nadi. Thank you very much, Marina, and uh, thank you for to all the organizers. There. In September 1972, President Ferdinand Marcos declared martial law in the Philippines due to the so-called communist threat and ruled the Philippines as a dictator for 14 years. And in exactly 20 days, his son, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., commonly known as Bong Bong, will resume the powers of the presidency. History repeats itself in a new guise. Within a week of martial law, Marcos Sr. instructed the Philippine Board of Censors that they should ban certain films to, quote, safeguard the morality of our society, particularly the youth, against the negative influence of certain motion pictures. The first kind of film being mentioned is films which tend to incite subversion, insurrection, or rebellion against the state. And as we will see, this very much echoes how Spanish and American colonial powers had handled film and other art forms. Three years into this martial law period, the chairman of the Philippine Censorship Board, Guillermo de Vega, who had been appointed by Marcos, wrote a book on the history of censorship, unironically called Film and Freedom. It was also endorsed by the Marcoses. Uh, Imelda wrote a glowing foreword, parts of which you can see here. And in the book, Guillermo de Vega described his attitude to censorship. Clearly, no censorship can be effective without embracing a higher purpose or philosophy. Censorship is more sublime than mere fault finding. The censors should first and foremost be architects of social change. In his history of film censorship in the Philippines, De Vega also erroneously claims that the first piece of legislation to regulate exhibition of films in the Philippines was from November 1929, when in fact it was from a few decades earlier. In this paper, I briefly trace the beginnings of film censorship in colonial Philippines from the Sedition Act of 1911 to the Manila City Ordinance on Film Censorship in 1911 to the Commonwealth Act passed and approved by the legislature in 1929, forming the nationwide board of censorship for moving picture that had the task to detect and prohibit films perceived as, quote, immoral or contrary to law and good customs or injurious to the prestige of the government or people of the Philippine Islands. In the paper, I argue that although morality has often been claimed as the main reason why we need to censor films in the Philippines, such as by Marcos, it is the fact of political reasons such as the fear of fanning the flame of independence that has in, a, in effect been the primary objective of censorship. Sedition and sedition laws is something that formed colonial rule in the Philippines and shaped many aspects that still reverberate in the Philippine society today. 
The national hero and author Jose Rizal was tried by a military court and shot by the Spanish colonial forces 30th of December 1896 for sedition, as well as rebellion and conspiracy. The Filipino Revolutionary Secret Society, the Katipunan, membership in which was banned and treated by the Spaniards as sedition, could also result in capital punishment. It is therefore understandable that the Americans, after this defeating the Spaniards, initially were hailed as saviors and harbingers of national Filipino independence. But in November 1901, the U US colonial government passed the sedition law, parts of it you can see here, which also targeted explicitly the theater and press, where writing and speaking about independence was labeled as treason and libel. You see, for instance, section eight that forbids seditious words or speeches. During this period, theater was the art form most, most affected by the sedition law. Films, not so much, mostly because Filipinos had not started making local film yet in the early 1900s. As an example of theater, Juan Abad's Golden Chain was about the character from 1902 was about the character Li Gaia, meaning light, who symbolized independence and who was the daughter of Dalina, who represented Philippines, uh, who was not allowed to see her love, Kaulayao, which was a um, Filipino hero. And uh, her, she was forbidden by her uncle Maimbot, meaning greedy and symbolizing the US government. In this play, Li Gaia, our heroine receives a golden bracelet from the American, the, the person symbolizing America, Maimbot, that becomes a chain that binds her to his control. This play was first staged at the Teatro Libertad in Manila in July 1902, and then it toured in theaters throughout the island of Luzon. Ten months later, in May 1903, provincial authorities shut it down for sedition, and the author was sentenced to two-year imprisonment and a fine of 2,000 pesos. There are many more examples of such plays being censored during these, these years of the sedition law. Using stories, the playwrights wrote about the desire for freedom and independence, about the oppression of the Philippines, and about American betrayal. Through sonography, subversive messages were sent implicitly and explicitly. People could be on stage forming through their custom colors, the Philippine flag, a flag which the display of which was forbidden by law during this time. Actors would suddenly sing the Filipino national anthem also forbidden by law. And in the plot of the film, they would include the trampling of the American flag. In 1913, James Blunt, officer of the United States Volunteers in first Cuba and then Philippines, and later a district judge in the Philippines, wrote about US colonial rule in his book, The American Occupation of the Philippines. In the book, he describes how everyone in the island of Samar, where he was placed as a district judge, would have been guilty of sedition since they were striving for independence. So he underlined this hypocrisy of the United States in celebrating freedom while colonizing another nation across oceans. Pointing out this hypocrisy was also common in the media discourse uh, up until basically the Second World War and the subsequent independence of the Philippines in 1946. In the book, James Blunt made uh, the following appeal for an independent Philippines and also underlines the problems of the term sedition, here also using England as a symbol of colonial power. England never acts the hypocrite with her colonies. She makes them behave. She does not let native people preach sedition in native newspapers because of sentimental bosh about freedom of the press until the whole country becomes a smoldering hotbed of sedition she has blown offending natives from the cannon's mouth when deemed necessary to cure them and their country of the desire for independence. If we are going to have colonies at all, we ought to govern them with the upright, downright, ruthless honesty of the British. It is more merciful in the long run. But we ought not to have colonies at all. 
For if there's one thing this Republic stands for, above all other things, it is the righteousness of aversion to a foreign yoke. Around this time, excuse the poor English quality, uh, movie theaters had mushroomed in Manila and locally made film productions started becoming more frequent. And warnings against indecent and immoral motion pictures started being spread. As with many other social, cultural, and political aspects, the Philippines also became a proxy battleground for American civic and religious organizations when it came to moving pictures. The Connecticut founded Catholic organization, the Knights of Columbus, attacked the evil brought about through exhibition of immoral pictures on cinematograph screens in 1911. This led to the Municipal Board of Manila passing a city ordinance on local censorship. The ordinance stated, no moving picture shall be presented publicly in the city until a special permit has been issued by the chief of police. And the board was also created where the collector of customs was chairman who would see to it that all pictures which are brought into the islands, the Philippine islands, be inspected by the new proposed board. Quickly, a group of film exhibitors and distributors in Manila gathered at a local theater and created the Association of Film Importers and Exhibitors of Manila to fight this censorship ordinance. Uh, C.S. Cole was its president and O.E. Shield its secretary. And uh, as you can see, the cinema industry at this time in Manila was still largely dominated by Americans. Before the first domestic film censorship case, which was in 1912, so we're still in November 1911, um, I managed to find instances of where the Manila censorship board was actually used in advertisements in the newspapers. When the Italian film Dante's Inferno from 1911 was released and exhibited at the Empire Theater in October 1912, the advert stated that the film has been inspected by the Manila censorship board, thereby also trying to uh, market itself to maybe more conservative audiences. A year after the creation of the Manila censorship board, the first cases of the censorship of locally produced films occurred. The local Manila newspaper, Cable News American wrote, two Filipino made history films are condemned by censorship board. These films were Edward Mayer Gross's The Three Marchers, which were the Filipino priests Gomez, Burgos, and Zamora, who were executed by the Spanish colonial forces in 1872. And also Grosses' film La Conquista de Manila, The Conquest of Manila, which is about how the Spaniards colonized the Philippines a few centuries earlier. Uh, the director Gross challenged the decision. And the complaint was that uh, the complaint from the censorship board was that, quote, historical fact was falsified in these films. So Gross challenged the decision and the case went to the municipal board and then to the mayor of Manila. The mayor, Felix Rojas, issued the following statement and he enforced the ban. He said, the Spanish community is one of the most important in these islands and might resent the exhibition of films which tend to excite the Filipino people against measures taken in the past by the Spanish authorities. An excitation which can lead to no legitimate social end, there being many other more gallant ways of manifesting patriotism aside from the sentiments of dissatisfaction which those spectacles inspires. So films were sometimes censored after being exhibited for more than a week because the censorship board didn't really have a cinema where it can, could pre-screen films and then it could react to complaints. Uh, and also when a film became censored, it could immediately be distributed throughout the Philippine islands as the censorship only covered screenings in Manila up until 1929. Another censorship case 
from late 1912 was Albert Yearsley's film adaptation of Severino Reyes's Zarzuela, i.e. a theater play, Walang Sugat, uh, No Wound or no, no Wounded, which is about the injustice of Spanish colonial rule. This play was deemed so dangerous for its theme of independence that also US colonial authorities forbade the play and shortly imprisoned the playwright in 1902. Yearsley's Walang Sugat, the film, screened for 11 days in Manila in 1912. Then it was censored for almost a year, but as a new police chief and a new censorship board came in 1913, the film was allowed to screen again. Finally, the first local film to be censored after the formation of the Philippine-wide Board of Censorship in 1929 was the film Ang Batang Tulisan, The Young Robber from 1937, which was primarily deemed objectionable because quote, it might give our young folk certain subversive ideas, and also because a priest was used as a villain. So I argue that this construction of cinema as a dangerous and potentially corrupting influence on individual viewers and the broader culture as being a moral crusade was largely just positioning. The true fear of the power of cinema during the colonial era was in weakening the colonial rule as well as the power of the elite, including that of the clergy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nadia, for that rich presentation. And you were actually on time as well, which I really appreciate. So uh, the next presenter uh, would actually be me. Uh, and uh, I'm a professor of cinema studies at uh, the Department of Media Studies at Stockholm University. And I'm currently working on a project uh, on modern media and the oil industry. And this is kind of other work that I'm working on, uh, on early cinema uh, censorship and editing in Sweden. So, uh, before 1905, anyone could exhibit moving pictures in Sweden. Screenings were few, and the films were, as preserved sources testify, in newspapers and elsewhere, considered quite harmless with their focus on travelogues and instructional titles. There were, of course, exceptions, and beheadings and other sensational brutalities were advertised from the very first years. And as we all know, from many sources, the lifelikeness of the medium were again and again underlined uh, with enticements such as bathing, dancings, etc. But it was not until the cinema boom uh, around 1905 when moving picture theaters began to make a mark on the Swedish cities as a regular entertainment, now with a new focus on dramatic titles that more and more critical voices were raised. The storm of opinion against the theatres, especially in Stockholm and Gothenburg, led the Office of Superintendents in Stockholm to send out the circular late 1905, directed to all police districts in the city concerning the quality of the moving pictures exhibited and the presence of children at the shows. As response to the circular, the superintendents did not only give an almost unanimous support to film censorship by the police, preferably before the screenings, but they also noted that inspections already existed in many places, even if not beforehand. The theater owners are mentioned in the report as most forthcoming when it came to make the films available for control and in any other way comply with the uh, authorities' requests. One of the police superintendents predicted that police regulations would prove insufficient, uh, as it would still be possible for a title to be banned by one district superintendent but permitted by another, as all titles had to be inspected in every district. And these circumstances would become a challenge during the upcoming years. The very same year, in December 1905, 
the local police commissioner uh, of every district were officially given the task to perform censorship on moving picture programs. The office of the governor also issued a number of guidelines for the local police forces concerning what should be prohibited on the screen. Uh, these were images that went against morality of the day, as well as murder, robberies and other serious crimes, scenes that could frighten children and all forms of inappropriate content were also banned. The local police were from now on to monitor both film venues and film content up until 1911, when a national censorship body, uh, the Swedish Board of Film Censors, was established in Sweden. From being a widely praised entertainment, moving images became a societal problem monitored by the police with suspicion and arbitrary severity. The years before 1911, pedagogical groups and especially the elementary school teachers launched an intensive de debate about the role of moving pictures in society, including a demand of accentu uh, accentuated police supervision of moving picture programs. For this presentation, I will focus on the activities of the pedagogical society and their negotiations with the local police during the period 1908 to 1911, a period when they conducted several studies documenting the repertoire as well as audience composition and also reactions at the moving picture theatres in Stockholm. At the, at the Swedish National Archive, material from the period 1908 until 1911 have survived, describing the activities and ideas of 40 volunteers of the Pedagogical Society's Moving Picture Committee. They went to every new film program in Stockholm, commenting directly on billboards and program sheets uh, that were then put together into a notebook. And it is this notebook we can see in these images. To the left, the register of all moving picture theatres in Stockholm. It was around 20 altogether at this time. And to the right, this sits and comments on the programme on the Tip Top Theatre, located, located at Drottninggatan at the very city centre. Many of the programmes at Tip Top were considered bad, wretched or even vulgar, and quite a few film titles were reported for example, the title Galai Slaven or Galai Slave on the program uh, screened at the committee's visit on the 2nd February 1909 were commented upon as very poor. Uh, but accordingly, after their report, the worst parts uh, had been cut. Also, the third title on this very program was cut after the report had been made. So the committee was quite uh, thorough and made quite a few uh, reports. But we will return to the Tip Top Theatre uh, shortly as it is my main example today. From the very start in March 1908, the Pedagogical Society's Moving Picture Committee had two goals. On the one hand, to find one or more theatres, uh, theatre owners for collaboration when it came to the selection of film programs. Three theater owners were, according to the committee's minutes from May 1908, interested, namely Brunkebergs Theatern, Apollo Theatern and Nya London Biografen. And they put their film programs under the control of the committee. On the other hand, the committee would have all moving picture theatres in Stockholm under supervision to make sure that they followed regulations and guidelines. If a volunteer from the Pedagogical Society found a title that stood in conflict with the, uh, the police guidelines, another one or two inspectors would visit and, uh, the show, after which a notification could be made to the police. My research questions, as I have dwelled on in the archives, have been to what extent did the Pedagogical Society influence the assessment of the local police? Were different decisions made on the very same film by different police districts a recurrent problem? As well as what were the ways to get around the control instances by title changes and piracy? The conditions shifted from one district to another, but as Bengt Idestam Angfist puts it, 
in his, in his comprehensive work on early film culture in Sweden, the censorship uh, was as a rule considered absolutely senseless in the newspapers and film journals uh, alike. As is described in the press, at times when a superintendent had finished correcting and cutting a drama, it ended up as a pitiable short film that were so cut down that the audience had problems even understanding the plot. As Valentin Grido remembers in an article celebrating the 25th uh, anniversary of the film medium in 1920, I quote, in a delightful and exciting romantic scene, they were cut just before the dangerous moment uh, were approaching. And in a film with villains, the film was cut just as a revolver where it was lifted, then to continue at the end of the very scene after all of the action had taken place." Unquote. An apt example is the uh, censorship of the popular Indian and cowboy films, the years uh, that preceded the National Censor Board. Almost all climax scenes were cut, even when a revol revolver was only seen hanging loose or uh, used to keep the person in line. Here we see the comments made by the Pedagogical Society directly on the programs on two cowboy films. On the one to the right, just commented on as bad. This sealer's censorship work was criticized by Nordisk Film Tidning, uh, a film journal in April 1910. The author of the piece argued that essential parts of the narrative were removed and thrilling actions diminished. The problem with local censorship was not only that their decisions on the, on the very same film widely varied, but also that banned films could still be shown under a new title in another theater uh, from the very same neighborhood. Judgments and taste were considered devastating different among superintendents, what one found improper and other accepted, uh, perhaps just across the street. There were even advertisements on bills and billboards saying, uh, come here and see this film that in another theater in the same neighborhood had been banned. This was a recurrent phenomenon in Stockholm, uh, but now let's go back to the Tip Top Theater. When Tip Top opened in the beginning of 1909, the owner of the theater, John Bergendahl, invested in one type of film, namely the Western. In Sweden, as in many other countries, the popularity of Indian and cowboy films was considerable at this time, uh, which is made evident by the number of such films advertised and screened. But these films also became a target of the Swedish censors. This was, for instance, the case of the Indian film entitled The Vita Liljan or The White Lily, possible a Lubin title, which was screened at Tip Top, but then banned by the police after complaint from the Pedagogical Society. As the uh, police report testifies, the manager of Tip Top, Johan Fritjof Ekholm, was accused of showing The Vita Liljan on the 19th of November 1909, there were three parts of the film to which complaints were made. The cowboy shooting at the thief who had abducted a young Indian girl, uh, the cowboy being tied to a pillory and tortured, and finally the cowboy killing his rival with a knife. In the coming months, the case were recurrently commented upon in the Stockholm newspapers ridiculing the process in which not even the prosecutor's only witness, the police constable uh, Lundén, found the film problematic. The newspaper Aftonbladet published a caricature on the topic with a small accompanying verse that we can see in this image. As Lundén states at court, the images were shown so quickly that it was difficult to really grasp any details. And other witnesses didn't find the Vita Liljan any worse than any other films shown, especially not in that neighborhood, that is Clara. Even the judge could think of many worse examples. Somewhat surprisingly is Ecom's response uh, in court that the program had already been exhibited uh, to two superintendents 
without any complaints before it was finally reported and also that Ecom didn't think that Indian pictures could cause any problems with the regulations. After several recesses, the verdict came on 19 December. The conclusion was that the regulations concerning moving picture screenings were not applicable uh, on the white uh, lily. Only four days later, on December 17, the newspaper Dagens Nyheter announces that the theater Tip Top had a new program, including the Vita Liljan. But the film had all along, according to the uh, film journal Nordisk Film Cleaning, been screened at another moving picture theaters in the very same neighborhood, albeit under another title. And in August 15, 1910, the film title appears in the catalog of Svensk Amerikanska Film Company's listed films. The draconic censorship of Western films and others were motivated by censorship supporters as there were no distinctions between films allowed for all audiences or only for adults. With the meticulous records made by the Swedish Board of Film Censors, it is quite easy to follow each film title and even each print, uh, censorship cuts, correspondence with the film companies, etc. Et but before December 1911, however, ever, it is much more difficult. But through the newspapers, we can get an idea about uh, changing public opinion when it comes to moving pictures and the new phenomena of moving picture theaters. This debate and activities of the pedagogical society, together with the work of local police departments to overlook the screenings, offer a rare example of early uh, censorship regimes before national censorship was established with a strict control of film copies, titles, and exhibitions. Thank you. So, uh, thank you all, and let's move on to our third speaker uh, in this panel, and it is uh, Öste uh, Selictemel Thurman. She's an historian of cinema and visual culture of the Ottoman Empire and the modern Middle East, and currently a postdoctoral fellow at Middle East Technical University's historical department. And the title of her talk today is Tracing Early Film Censorship in the Late Ottoman Empire. Terrific. So I'll start this. Hello everyone, this is Ozat Çelik Temel Toman. Thank you for joining us today. I'd like to first thank the organizers for this great conference. This presentation examines the intentions of the late Ottoman authorities in regulating cinema for film production, exhibition, and circulation between 1896 and the early 1910s in the Ottoman Empire. I classify my presentation based on the political leadership and only attempt to cover the itinerant years of cinema. So my focus is the final years of the Hamidin era. During the period of the Committee of Union and Progress, Iddat ve Terak in Turkish, which was the ruling party starting from 1908 till 1918, we see the introduction of commercial cinemas and permanent venues. Also, the wartime strategies affect the whole plethora of cinema censorship. I prefer to leave this period uncovered today. I'm looking forward to researches for a different conference presentation. I follow here a number of research questions, such as how did the Hamidian censorship policies affect cinema regulations? Did the Sultan directly impose any systematic regulation over the expansion of cinema. Who regulated cinema, both in the center and provinces in the large territory of the empire? During the itinerant film exhibition years, there was no censorship committee in charge of viewing films in the Ottoman Empire. All the existing regulations of performing arts served also for early cinema's development. 
the opening of cinema houses gradually led to the formation of more standardized cinema regulations. Ottoman bureaucrats, elite, and certain segments of audiences contributed to the emergence of banning specific films, preventing film exhibitions at certain venues, and interfering with the attendance of women and children in film screenings. Within the chaotic years of war, political, religious, and national topics in films caused anxiety for the political leadership. Obscene and violent images in films became a hot topic when vulnerable audiences were present at screenings. Within a multidisciplinary approach, the study of regulation borrows concepts from a number of disciplines, such as law, economics, cultural and historical studies. Scholars have defined the term regulation within a wide range of studies from various angles. Regulation can take the form of social control and influence practiced by government or public agencies that can ultimately create a restricted or facilitative structure. Inspired by the perspective of Robert Baldwin and Martin Kay, I weave the process of designing cinema regulations as the introduction of a manageable working system in which a clearly defined set of rules, restrictions, control, and influence emerge in both deliberate and incidental practices for a developing cinema market. The Hamidian state's measures and interventions reveal themselves in the form of the censoring of certain films, limiting the age of the audience, restricting certain topics in film content, reinforcing gender segregation, last but not least, promoting a specifically designated space for exhibition venues, namely commercial cinemas. The state also assured facilitative means for a working structure of the cinema market by promoting filmmaking and supporting foreign and local cinema entrepreneurs. Here, the concept of public becomes the focal point in the studies of media regulation. In this way, scholars study both perspectives of the state and policymakers along with the consumers. Rakesh Koshal indicates that regulation can best be understood as a set of institutionalized routines directed towards the achievement of certain desirable ends. And he proposes that scholars must investigate the organizational framework of regulatory schemes. Within this perspective, in the late Osman case, most of the textual archival materials from draft regulations to complaints and license applications reveal important data about the division of tasks between central and local government agencies and also cinema entrepreneurs. It is important to explore the meanings of censorship. Censorship is often connected to the acts of states and governing entities as a way of controlling the expression of political or immoral ideas in films. But it is also the fact that industries self-censor. For instance, by the late 1910s, Hollywood studios self-censored throughout its classical history in order to avoid the intervention of state censorship. Aneth Kuhn's observations on British censorship offer a useful insight. She evaluates the censorship of cinema as a matter of relations and a process in which a series of relations between different institutions emerge and contribute to the regulations. She questions the view of censorship as a repressive act and also points out the productive side of censorship. Kuhn notes that prohibition and productivity can be regarded as two sides of the same coin. Censorship during the Hamidian era was mostly practiced by censor officers, secret police, and inspectors. These officials within certain bureaucratic institutions, by and large, interpreted the existing set of rules regarding printed media and entertainments, and then gradually introduced a number of amendments 
to the legal procedure. Throughout the years, closing down enterprises led the authors, editors, actors, and business owners in the publishing and entertainment sectors to internalize certain restrictions and limits. Fatma Gül Demirel indicates that even though there was systematized censorship in this period, the number of publications in the form of books, magazines, and newspapers immensely increased. Ebru Boyar notes that this increase was partly due to the Hamidin subsidy paid to the printed media. Donald Chiota's work on censorship in the Ottoman provinces of Lebanon and Syria offers new insights into Hamidin censorship. He writes that the Ottoman Empire, like all states, limited to some extent the content of publications for reasons of national security, to protect public morale and order, to preserve public morality, and to protect individual reputations. Based on this argument, it can be concluded that censorship was the justification and necessity of the ruling elite in reference to the political stability and order. The censor officers watched over Ottomans at different public venues, from coffee houses and theaters to hammams and taverns. They collaborated with the police in order to enforce the regulations. The censor officers were the eyes of the Sultan, watching over people and reporting suspicious, oppositional, immoral, and illicit activities to the central government. Let us explore a case of film censorship. In 1902, a news report, Journal, sent to the Minister of Interior, portrayed the banning of pictures that had been screened at Manoli's Tavern in Mersin. The ban was ordered because the operator Dimitri's screening contained the image of Sultan Abdulaziz, riding a horse along with other European leaders' images. The archival document reads that a number of images with the help of a cinematograph were exhibited at the tavern, and it was inappropriate and disrespectful to the memory of the deceased Sultan. The document notes that the report was sent to the local administration. The governor of Adana later contacted the Minister of Interior and informed the authorities about this screening at the tavern. The Minister of Interior confirmed the ban, but noted that it was not forbidden to screen other images about various topics, except the political ones. Indeed, the Hamidin era gradually witnessed the control of the circulation of images, such as postcards and portraits. This was regulated by the broader censorship practices of all printed media. Historian Ethan Aldan contends that restrictions had hardly any impact, as most of the material circulated through foreign post offices over which the Ottoman authorities had little jurisdiction. This was the case also for itinerary film screenings. Early attempts to regulate cinema represent a period of uncertainty. Regulation enforcement was carried out with regard to specific individual cases in relation to the existing regulations and the officers' interpretations of the rules. Now let's dive into the 1903 cinematograph privilege, in which we can observe the attempts to set the rules for production criteria and the exhibition procedure for inspecting and monitoring films. Seven years after the arrival of films to the empire, a legal document was drafted to grant privilege to cinema entrepreneurs in the Ottoman Empire. It was entitled, The Conditions of the Privilege of Screening Cinematograph in the Ottoman Empire. In Ottoman Turkish, Memaliki Shahanede, Cinematograph Temasha Ettirmesinin Şeraiti İmtiyazı Yasi. It can be accessed at the Ottoman Archives Yıldız catalog, where the documents from the Hamidin era are preserved today. It has the signatures of two Ottoman subjects, Ibrahim bin Yunus and Ahmet, from Bakırköy district of Istanbul. 
The content of the conditions revealed that the Sultan's role for the approval of film exhibition and production and the recognition of official institutions in relation to specific liabilities. For instance, the clauses show that Sultan Abdul Hamid II is the central power to grant the rights for film screens. The content of the privileges defines the responsibilities of the individual or company and requires loyalty to the Ottoman state, courts, and Sultan Abdul Hamid II. The strategies used to regulate and manage cinema were characterized by the 1904 decision of the Ministry of Interior to organize a preview committee for the films. In this way, film exhibitions could only be held if the operators or the owners of venues maintained a license for film exhibition. Yet, this legal decision was not enforced, only practiced in an ad hoc manner. As was the case with other laws on cinema, the 1904 decision was not enforced. These features of cinema regulations indicate ambivalence. Unenforced regulations tend to create jurisprudential problems in various ways, one of those being the ad hoc banning of films. The duties of censor officers varied during the late Ottoman era. Archival sources reveal that censor officers could view the films at venues and their related technical and media components, such as cinematic devices, projectors, cameras, and lamps, and the film content, including handbills. They also dealt with financial matters, such as ticketing problems at venues and the gathering of taxes from film screenings. Archival sources show that any printed materials regarding film exhibitions were inspected by censor officers prior to public announcements. This would include visuals and handbills. For instance, a 1909 report from a censor officer shows how he checked the handbill of the Palmyra Printing House located in the Bay of the District of Istanbul and suggested the removal of some parts of it after his examination. The archival document does not provide further detail about the content of the handbill, but this case shows that the failure of the printing house to obey censor officers' instructions will result in the prohibition of the handbill about film program. In conclusion, the central subject in this presentation was the attempt to discern the authorities' intentions to regulate cinema by introducing specific legal decisions. I suggest that this was the era in which the authorities still gathered information about the new technology of cinema and dealing with exhibitions on certain physical conditions. The technical aspect of cinematic devices and the fu function of films in political and sociocultural fields. Censoring certain films and regulating film exhibitions were an ongoing interrelation practiced by the Sultan and his officials and cinema entrepreneurs' demands. Early cinema regulations were affected by the Hamidian state's ideology, social and political instability, opposition movements, and policies on printed media and other communications. Thank you very much. I will end here. Thank you so much, Esther, for that interesting presentation. Do we have our last uh, two speakers with us, Martin? Yes, I believe so. Okay, perfect. Uh, then for our last presentation with the title War and Law, uh, Unexpected Consequences of the Itali uh, Italo-Turkish uh, War, 1911 to 1912, on Italian copyright and censorship lawmaking. Uh, we have two speakers. We have Maria Asunta uh, Pimpinelli, head of film collections at the Centro Sperimentale di Cinematografia uh, in Rome. And she has been responsible for several restoration projects and involved in a multiple uh, year survey on the United Film Collection of the CSC. Uh, we also have Luca Matze, and he's an uh, assistant professor at the University of Rome, 
and his research focus on the relation uh, between film and documentary material in the history of Italian cinema. And his uh, latest book, which is he co-edited, is Early Film Theories in Italy, 1896 to 1922. So uh, welcome, and, uh, and the screen is yours. Thank you for the presentation and the session. And do you, do you hear me? Okay. And uh, I we have a presentation. So okay, presentation that it okay, okay, okay. So our intervention uh, seeks to compare uh, three moments in the history of Italy, so far never put in direct uh, contrast with uh, each other. Uh, the establishment of the chairmanship on cinematographic film, the first copyrighted recording for actualité, uh, the impact on Italian society of the Italo-Turkish war. In fact, our impression is that the italo turkish war is uh, at the root of some historical singularities, otherwise incomprehensible. So let's start with a summary analysis of the first event, first event the institution of censorship. When does censorship start in Italy? It is, is it to answer? The law on film censorship in Italy was released in June 1913, and the institution became operational in the summer. Before then, the moral control over movies was secured only by the facts, that is, to institution with a citizen operating range. The fact may appear uh, odd. At the end of the 1911, in Italy, the consumption of film was uh, definitely on the way, while the production and the distribution system uh, were already consolidated. Moreover, most of the citizens were now familiar with the movies. Consequently, the debate on the morality of cinema uh, was already very extensive at the time, not only in the Catholic press. From 1909 onwards, uh, there are many newspapers, including local ones, where the debate on the morality of cinemas is very, very present. However, during the second half of 1911 and the first semester of 1912, when the consumption of cinema increased, the debate on the press slows down. The debate restarts only in October 1912. To launch the controversy is Giovanni Battista Avellone, a lawyer linked to the right wing. On uh, October 1912, the Roman newspaper Giornale d'Italia uh, published a letter of Avellone uh, which was a long attack on cinematography, intended as a moral business and a school of vice. He received several um, response, the letters to the newspaper, and in the next days, uh, other magazines and other newspapers uh, um, enter in, in the debate. In Parliament, however, nothing moved, at least until March 1913. Only the session of uh, 15 March 1913, Chamber of Deputies addressed the issue. The debate was open, was open by the Honorable Giulio Alessio from the Radical Party. He says that um, acts of violence, brutal scenes, criminal gestures that are seen in the cinema uh, 
are particularly pernicious, especially in the case of the moviegoers of the low social class, because those images arrive to moviegoers without the filter of the words. Honorable Alessio uh, therefore recommends the Prime Minister and Minister of the Interior, Giovanni Giolitti, to seriously consider the problem. Giolitti replies to Alessio directly. Just a few days ago, he remembers, uh, he sent a circular to the prefect recommending that uh, they monitor this type of representation particularly those which focus on acts of violence, she said in Italian passività. Uh, the timing is unusual. Uh, perhaps the intervention is concerted. Giolitti always adds in fact that uh, this phenomenon is, is something that uh, has arisen only in recent times. And it uh, has not been uh, disciplined because uh, at the beginning it uh, don't seem that it should take a real importance as, uh, as it uh, has now assumed. As you know, the problem does not seem to have emerged, emerged only in the few weeks before. But it is certain that in those days everything undergoes a sudden acceleration. In fact, uh, the session of uh, um, 6 June uh, um, 1913, the text of the censorship state law is already under discussion. Present, uh, presented in, present it to, uh, to the parliament, Honorable Marais, supported by President, President Giulitti. And, Intervene for the opposition, uh, Honorable, Honorable Turati and uh, Honorable Maria Mara, uh, and uh, Honorable Trek. This happens in the morning, and in the afternoon, the law is already approached. The process of approval is very, very fast. However, the censorship law of 1913 is a very important thing. With this law was established that the country, uh, was uh, established the country first tax on cinema. The reason for the combination into a single law was simple. An ad hoc budget was needed uh, to sustain the budget uh, of the central state office. And uh, where to get it if not from the Exhibitors themselves uh, that uh, is uh, from the co economic establishment that causes the need for the shelter for the censorship. In short, the uh, Italian censorship uh, one would have been a virtually zero cost or is found uh, and uh, found it together on uh, Catholic. Uh, morality, but also on uh, economic uh, liberalism. Of course, the sources in the specific case, Fred and Turati, protest. According to them, uh, the institution of censorship only serves to justify the institution of the cinema tax, which is the real goal of the government. And therefore, for them, screenings, uh, for them, screenings of actuality, newsreels, and educational fields uh, should be accepted for the provision. But the moral control on, on these, those fields uh, is, not, uh, is not in question. It's not in question for them. Only one voice rises against. Uh, this law, and it's the voice of Gaetano Salvelli in the newspaper Lurita, but it's too little voice. In, uh, in July 1913, however, the chess, the censorship was instituted. Coming up, we have 
a phase of early debate, which remained active uh, until uh, 1911, a substantial freezing of the debate, his awakening in the press in uh, October 1912, the activation of a parliamentary procedure at the, at the end of 1912, and uh, the law in June 1913. So, I, It's up to me, can you hear me? Okay. It's okay. So uh, I continue, thanks Luca. Mm -hmm. And um, I continue with the historical background of this period, which is represented by the Italo Turkish War. On September 29, 1911, Italy declares war on Ottoman Empire and invades Libya. In the same months, Italy is improving its cinema production, shifting to feature length films, shifting to the distribution system. Among the goals of the conflict, Italy wants above all to appear a modern and powerful nation. Therefore, all the new technological means are shown to the public opinion, not only as offensive instruments, but also as new instruments of communication. The most important of them is, of course, cinematography, seen as a new weapon for the conflict. The result is a considerable, completely new war propaganda made through films. And during that period, we can count more than 100 Dal Vero films, non-fiction films, at least 10 series newsreels, and more than 30 fiction films. And among them, at least 90% are produced in Italy. These results come from <clears throat> the research we are carrying out, which aims to reconstruct the complete filmography related to the italo turkish war. So back to the historical background. In spring summer 1912, the war reaches the Aegean Sea, which was still under Ottoman Empire, but in spite of this, the conflict lasts only until October 1912, since in this period, the Ottoman Empire starts to be involved in the new difficult First Balkan War. The conflict continues in 1913 in form of guerrilla, guerrilla against the local tribes, but gradually the military involvement decreases along with the interest in the war propaganda film. So is there a relationship between the decrease of interest or in the military campaign and the renewed interest in the ethical question debated by Italian politicians? We think yes, but we will see after all. About right registration, everything starts from a legislative act, which is the circolare, it means memorandum, sent to the prefects by the minister Francesco Nitti, also known as Circolare Nitti, in March 26, 1912. The goal of this memorandum is to adapt the copyright law, the Regio, the regio Decreto, means the law from the king, in, uh, uh, uh, published in uh, September 1882, so to adapt this old law to the needs of the cinematographic, cinematographic market, sorry. As far as films are involved, this memorandum says that for works that de destined to public exhibition, always indicate if it was already shown and in case the date and place of the first person. Presentation. Second important uh, thing, it is always requested to add a sample of the work to the declaration. It can be the deposit of the whole film, but also the frames of the main scenes or just a summary. This memorandum, which probably is 
not com was not conceived on purpose to benefit the producers of non-fiction films, but only to solve general rights problems connected with national cinema, is published when the Dal Vero non-fiction production in Italy reaches its maximum development. In this regard, one of the most significant roles is played by Luca Comerio. Um, you can, you, I share the screen um, or you show the same thing. Okay, thank you. You share or I, I must share? You share, it. there was before. So Luca Comeria, go ahead. A uh, prominent figure, photographer. He was not by chance official photographer of the royal family. But yes, we I can share, share the PowerPoint. I share, I share okay. It. Okay. Okay. okay. Okay. Okay. Okay. Here is Luca Comerio. And okay, now you see it's the same, so we have shared the, the same PowerPoint. So I was saying <clears throat> Luca Comerio, photographer, not by chance official photographer of the royal family, but film director, producer, and operator, operator himself. He was the first in spring 1912 to register some non-fiction titles as work of intellect worthy to be protected according to the Italian copyright law already mentioned and taking advantage of the so-called Circolare Nitti uh, published in March 26, on March 26, 1912. So in 1912, Comerio produces several monographic works dedicated to war events. They are included in the current filmographies and now we know them better thanks to our recent and still ongoing filmographic research about Italo-Turkish war. The first title registered is this one, La Battaglia delle Due Palme. The original title is longer, but it is known as La Battaglia delle Due Palme. And it's a, a two real films dedicated to a war episode happened in March 1912 in Cirenaica, east of Tripoli. As you see, the film exists and is conserved in two versions, both incomplete. And what you see here is the uh, Cineteca Nazionale Rome version. Uh, the registration happened in the Registro, Pub Registro Publico Generale per la Riserva dei Diritti d'Autore, General Public Register for the protection of authors' rights. And as you see, the registration is made in the Gazzetta Ufficiale, um, which is for, for us now a precious source by the way searchable online. And you see here the registration of the film, Comerio Luca, uh, and so on, meter 500 meters, not yet projected before the deposit. And in another page, you find that uh, 17 samples of films and then also with the summary were presented as uh, to, to deposit, uh, were deposited for the registration. So this is the first film, uh, non-fiction registered by Luca Comerio. Then going, uh, ahead with our search, we have found three other Comerios titles registered as author's work. Two titles are registered in this other number of Gazzetta Ufficiale del Regno d'Italia. Um, the date of registration is August 10, 1912. What you see is the number of the Gazzetta, which is a little later, January 1913. And this film's both Il viaggio trionfale del generale Amelio verso le isole dell'Egeo is a, an episode of the war on the Aegean Sea, and the other, La battaglia di Sidi Said, are not conserved 
but we know about uh, the, the topic. Uh, for instance, La Battaglia di Sidi Said was a battle not far from the Tunisian border, which wanted to, um, to conquest a strategic place uh, at the tomb of the holy man, the Marabutto means this, what is, what is written in the long title of the film. And this, in this case as well, uh, you see there is the deposit of two uh, frames of the main scenes and the uh, non-edited summary of the action. The fourth film registered by Luca Comerio is a well-known one and conserved Cineteca Nazionale in Rome, La Presa di Zuara, and you see it has been restored and presented in some different occasions. And it's also available uh, online at the Portale del Cinema Muto Italiano, you see in the next slide. And what is uh, interesting is that Comerio himself is represented as a chief operator and director of the of the shoots. So I pass back to, to Luca for his conclusions and then I will have my short conclusions after Luca. Okay, thank you. So <clears throat> okay, I think so short. Okay. So um, let's go back to Point one, uh, censorship. It is possible uh, that uh, it was the Italo-Turkish war that created the timing with which uh, the legislative device was imposed. It is possible that the war slowed down the process. Uh, we don't have uh, a certain answer, but uh, it's certain that the interest of the ruling, ruling classes, uh, particularly the political groups that supported the war, the, the political interest in the cinema was very high. Furthermore, there is another clue, indirect perhaps, but still important. On February 1914, a parliamentary debate was underway in the Chamber of Deputies on the expenses due to the Libyan war. Taking advantage of the occasion, the socialist deputy, Ulolebole Giletti, takes the floor and accuses the government of having inflamed public opinion for months for war purposes. To do this, the government would not only have used newspaper, he says, but also movie theater, film and movie theater. Modern temples of Janus, in which scenes of blood and violence were continually presented to the public, also to children, were producing war episodes with the glasses held of the military authorities who supplied to cinematographers, soldiers, uh, as soldiers troops and mass, as mass actors. What uh, asked Giretti is uh, how, what implicit asked Giretti is uh, how could the Italian government at the time engage the promotion through the propaganda fields uh, of act of violence hit those some houses that produces the film and the public with a double act of censorship and the tax of cinema. So, yes, um, as far on the other end, uh, for the first copyright registration for Italian films, a systematic investigation has yet to be carried out, both at the Central State Archives and at the State Archives in various Italian cities, in search of what we define Italian style right 
books containing film frames and they are media objects very similar to the USA copyright registration and never studied so far. Celluloid frames and strips that some scholars in the mid 90s of the last century from our first informal investigation seem to have found and then put back in folders of the archives without spreading the news too much precisely because at the time they were not well classifiable. This kind of Italian style paper prints, we could um, call them as paper prints, if found and studied would offer not only valuable information on the registration and protection of right practices in Italy in the first decade of last century, but also an unprecedented look at the Italian cinema of the time, from the one recovered so far, but still subject to the hypothesis of textual reconstruction, to the one considered lost. Thanks. And, uh, and, and for uh, new, so, uh, pardon, for uh, new inform uh, for uh, the question of the birth of the churchship in Italy, uh, many, also many areas uh, are to be investigated. Much new information, uh, could come from a credible and uh, extensive, extensive analysis of the newspapers, especially to the local ones, and from the non cinema magazine, so far very little investigated in it. So, thanks. Thank you so much for that rich presentation. Uh, let's see if you could close the PowerPoint. Stop. Yes. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, do we have any questions? Nadi. I could I could pose a question to get the discussion going. Uh, it was a, it was a question to um, and thank you all for your presentation. It was a question to us the uh, and uh, apologies if you answered this, but I didn't catch it. But how how did the censorship differ in the different regions of the Ottoman Empire? Thank you, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I didn't uh, really look at the provinces that much, and I didn't give that comparison, but. Good that you brought it up. So uh, I mainly gave examples from center, Istanbul, the imperial capital. And we talk about a wide territory from Balkans to um, actual Thessaloniki was under Ottoman rule until 1912. So it's a short period of time when we consider the arrival of the film. And Thessaloniki was very autonomous, for instance, or the same for Beirut which was under the Ottoman rule at the time when the movies arrived first. Um, so we always see that, um, that uh, most of the provinces, apart from Anatolia, which was connected uh, to Istanbul via trains or, you know, uh, with the officials interconnectedness to the capital, the, the palace, um, there are differences. So, Reflecting now, and uh, I should say that with these autonomous provinces, we can claim that um, the central power was not uh, powerful when it came to banning certain films. Why? Because um, all of those showmen or operators could travel anywhere they wanted at the time. That's number one. So there is this. Um, uh, fragility of the central power with its apparatus with the secret police or censorship officers or or anyone connected to the center and number two is I guess um, it, it very much dependent on the complaints that the central government received from those provinces uh, for instance the Mersin example I gave uh, dates back to 1902 
it's the Mediterranean coast, right? Close to Istanbul. But right after the audience members informed the censor officer, the censor officers also informed the police and then mayor and then minister of interior heard about the film screening, right? So um, in terms of censorship, we can claim that especially during this time per time of period when we didn't have the uh, commercial cinemas or, you know, registration of the films or license applications. Um, we see that uh, the control of the films, banning of the films, was very much dependent on uh, what it is that it was about and the power of the local forces, so to speak. But is this clear enough? Some? Yeah, thanks. So, yeah. Esther, we have another question for you. Uh, oh. It seems to me that the exhibitor you mentioned whose film was censored had a Greek name. Was he okay. an Ottoman Greek? Anything else you can tell us about the incident? The name is Dimitri, right? Um, correct, you got it correct. Who, who's asking the question? Oh, Vasiliki, okay. Yeah. Hello, Vasiliki. <laughs> um, this uh, record comes from the Ottoman archives. It's a textual, uh, written form, which is which contains only five or six sentences. And, and there's correspondence between the, uh, me, uh, how should I put it? Um, the government, the, the mayor of Adana, but it's from another province, Mersin. So we're very limited with the information we have. I only have that Dimitri uh, is a traveling operator who came from Izmir by a boat to Mersin. Just think of the Aegean coast, and then I don't have the map if I had the presentation, but so he, he rides on a boat and, and goes to different places maybe. He must have traveled different parts of the uh, coastal line. When the authorities heard that this film screening took place in Mersin, he was sent back by boat to Izmir. So Izmir at the turn of the century is a very cosmopolitan city. So and close to the uh, uh, Greece, right? Uh, close to Greece. So operators could travel between Greece and Ottoman Empire. So I'm not sure if he was a room uh, or, or Ottoman citizen or coming from Greece. So at this period, um, this is again a speculation. I suppose um, Dimitri must have been someone who had connections with the uh, European market, right? So he might even have dual citizenship. <laughs> he might be traveling from one place to another, like other uh, operators of the time. So this is the only information I have. Sorry. <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, Martin, we had another question from Abu Bakar that we would put online or? OK. No? He should, he should be able to ask. Let's see. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, uh, in particular uh, to the last uh, panelists. I was really extremely, extremely inspired by it, in particular in relation to the work that I presented earlier today. First of all, um, I would like to find out more about the figure of uh, is it Luca Comerio, who actually uh, who I think uh, you mentioned was a um, sort of photographer of the <coughs> Italian royal family. It so happened that Shikli was also the photographer and cinematographer of the Tunisian royal family, the Bay of Tunisia, whom he filmed for about at least 30 years, I think, at least 30. So it would be good to, and, and, and, and, and, and I think their, their, their respective itinerary speaks to what I also one of the things that I was trying to argue earlier in my presentation, which is the question of shared historiography. This clear that in the case of the Italo Turkish War, we have we have a clear case of shared historiography, with Shikli filming on one side from the North African side and French side, even I should I add. And of course, uh, Comerio from the Italian side. So I think there's comparative notes it seems to, me to be had uh, to be had here. Um, uh, so 
I'll be curious to find out more about uh, the, the filmography that you're working on, as it, it seems to me that it could add to certainly our knowledge of uh, sort of Italian presence in Africa uh, uh, before World War I in particular, and certainly also about uh, let the uh, question of the presence of cinema, or at least of Italian cinema, in Libya in particular. Now, the other thing also that I'm wondering, because uh, Shikli was arrested on that that that uh, boat called the Carthage on his way back, I believe, from the Italo-Turkish War. And if my memory is correct, so don't quote me, but if my memory is correct, it appears that his, his film footage or photographic footage may have been confiscated. And so it would be interesting for me to know if in the research that you're doing somewhere, you may come across uh, uh, stuff that perhaps belongs to him somehow, who knows? So these are some of the observations I wanted to make. I don't know if you have any Okay. Uh, I also, okay. Uh, yes, Shikli um, make some, some shots of, uh, is on, um, on the, the Carthage, when the Carthage, uh, the, the boat Carthage was uh, stopped near Sardinia, and uh, and uh, he he made some shots about um, police Italian police with which goes to the um, to the Manuba and Carthage to the to the boat, and um, he. Um, he saved some shots, and so the shot of the, the of the Manuba of the arrested people in Manu, in Manuba um, arrive in French. So we um, it, the the the Shiki film uh, the Shiki film uh, uh, is not um, screened in Italy. But uh, we know that uh, it's screened uh, in in French, and we are sure that is a Shikli on the boat, and we are sure that Shikli made some some shot of um, of the Italo Turkish War by Ottoman style, but um, in uh, as you know, uh, it's impossible in uh, it's impossible to to make um, to make shot of the war in uh, Italian style from non-Italian operators. So this is this is uh, the, um, the panorama, and uh, I answer to the to the question. Uh, about um, earlier copyright themes in the regional Italian archives. Uh, yes, uh, so um, it, uh, there is not uh, uh, earlier copyrighted uh, actualité in the regional in the regional Italian archives. The actualité um, are copyrighted only. Uh, only from 1912 and uh, not uh, not before, not before. Uh, the Chicago uh, allows to uh, copyright uh, actualité, which are out of uh, copyright question in, in before. Uh, thank you so much. I would have a question to Nadi, actually. I, I was really inspired by this censorship in colonial Philippines um, 
that you and your examples that you you mentioned. I was wondering in your monograph um, about the U.S. colonies and what what kind what will you do there? Will you kind of elaborate on, on the censorship questions in in uh, U.S. colonies or or will you? I mean, that would be really interesting. I think. So, what are your plans? Yeah, pr prior to this uh, conference and presentation, I wasn't planning to discuss uh, censorship that much, but I think this conference has uh, has changed that. Like I, I realized, at least in the case of the Philippines, that is like so so tightly uh, connected to colonial rule, which is what what I'm interested in. Like how how how cinema was used as a colonial tool. So so in in that sense, this really goes well with that and to also address uh, Tanya's uh, question in the Q&A um, I will definitely uh, so I haven't uh, drawn parallels uh, transnationally and trans imperially between the development of censorship regulations but I will uh, definitely do that and compare in this case Hawaii Puerto Rico uh, and and Philippines and see like what what common principles were there in developing censorship? Absolutely. Maybe it's possible to follow like one title or something to, uh, hmm. yeah. Uh, let's see, do we have more questions? Luca Maria, uh, is it possible there are early copyrighted films in the original Italian archives? I, I asked. Uh, I just asked her before. Uh, it's it, it, it, it, uh, it's possible, but it's not possible for actualité. Uh, the Circularity, which was released in uh, 1912, was the the, uh, the law which uh, allows to actualité to be registered. Before the Circularity, it's impossible to register a in, in actuality, uh, a non-fiction film. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have more questions? Otherwise, we're just on time. Uh... Yes. If we no more questions, um, so. Thanks again for such a terrific uh, second day. We will be back uh, tomorrow at the same time, 10 a.m. Eastern uh, for our third uh, day of the conference. And also uh, please come to the uh, gathering in the afternoon at, um, it will be at 1 p.m. Eastern time, the General Assembly. Um, so I look forward to seeing you then and have a great evening, afternoon, whatever it might be. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Great. Ciao.